Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for coming to my talk this morning on uh, interventional sports medicine. I have about 25, 30 minutes worth of material here, and um, we'll have time at the end for questions and so on. Um, so to frame up this topic, first, I just want to point out this is not a board's review. So I, I noticed there's not too many seniors here, so that's just fine. They can, they can uh, study more this morning. Um, what is interventional sports medicine? Um, I think of it as the translation of clinical and imaging diagnosis into targeted percutaneous therapy for musculoskeletal disorders, um, kind of a mouthful. Um, but it's basically using our our image diagnostic skills and image guided interventional skills to treat MSK disorders. So let's frame it up by looking at a case of a 19 year old college basketball player with lateral foot pain. And as we often do, we did an MRI scan on her and we found a small cystic lesion at the tarsal metatarsal junction here on this coronal T2 weighted MRI. Here it is on axial. And we know that with ultrasound, we can see these types of cystic lesions pretty well, so we offered to go ahead and, and drain this cyst. So here's a little clip of the ultrasound where remember that the transducer is going to be on the skin surface like here, and here's the bone surface, here's the small cyst, and you can see the tip of a 25 gauge needle in the cyst. Uh, alternatively, like injecting some anesthetic and then draining it and ending up with injecting some corticosteroids to treat potential inflammation. So that's just an example to kind of frame up the, the concept. So you can see before the, the cystic lesion here and then after much smaller, been drained with some anti-inflammatory placed around it. And I won't go into the drugs in detail here today, but what I do is um, on many of the slides, I'll put what drug we used. And so dexamethasone is a short acting corticosteroid. And so in this particular patient, the, the concept was that this lesion was probably pressing on a local nerve and causing some nerve type symptoms distally in the foot. And by draining it, we reduced the pressure on that nerve and allowed her to play for the uh, remainder of the season. So what I'll do is go through a little bit of background. And then I've broken this up into different categories uh, that are relatively clean, um, but cystic lesions and bursal collections, peritendinous inflammation, and muscle contusion and strain. So the types of disorders that we target in MSK are, are listed here, at least in part, and a lot of the mass type lesions are cystic lesions like ganglion cyst or synovial cyst. Um, I'll show some examples of hematoma. Seroma is obviously possible as well. And I grayed out abscess because that's really not part of our, our practice to drain infection. We leave that to the IR folks uh, who may leave catheters in. So none of this has to do with leaving catheters in a collection, although in principle that's obviously possible. The inflammatory disorders like bursitis, tenosynovitis, and synovitis. We do a lot of joint injections as well, and this is also really not the, the, con the topic of this morning's um, lecture because that's really fluoroscopic, uh, fairly simple joint injections, which is a, a separate talk. So what are the indications? Well, these are things that are not getting better with medical therapy or drugs or, or laying off, but surgery is really not indicated because of maybe timing or it's not desired by the patient or the team somehow, so that we need something in between. A big benefit of this is to diagnose pain generators, so a lot of the injections involve injection of local anesthetic into the area of interest, and that can definitely help tell whether the pain is coming from that structure or area or not. And the main thing is really therapy. So we can decompress mass lesions, we can inject corticosteroids, and at the end I'll talk a little bit about platelet-rich plasma, which is rather new uh, type of therapy. Again, as far as background goes, it's important to work with sports medicine or orthopedic surgeons that know kind of what we can do and what we can't do. Um, usually the imaging workup includes MRI, should, it should include plain films typically as well. And obviously it's really important to correlate the patient's symptoms with what we see on imaging. Uh, that cystic lesion in the foot, if it's uh, incidental and asymptomatic, it doesn't make any sense to go after it. And image guidance wise, um, a lot of what I'll show is ultrasound, fluoroscopy is available, some, some procedures we do under CT, 
uh, when we had interventional MRI, we would use that occasionally as well. So let's talk a little bit about cystic lesions and bursitis. And Baker's cyst is kind of a good thing to use as a starting point if you're thinking about doing this because they're fairly simple and common. And here's a typical sagittal MRI of a Baker's cyst posterior to the knee, uh, nicely seen on ultrasound here as well. So in this ultrasound, again, the transducer is going to be here. Here's the femoral condyle. So this would be like the patient lying prone with the head up here and the feet down here and posterior here. Pretty easy to see that cyst. And one of the things about ultrasound is that we can see local vessels, and that's very helpful to avoid them. Um, it's also the case that when we see the lesion directly, we can actually make sure we drain it completely. So if you look at the procedure for that patient, one of the things we do is we always monitor the needle coming all the way from the skin surface into the lesion. And so here's this needle coming into this structure here. And you can see the needle is kind of jiggling as we come in. That's, uh, that's to help see the needle. As you move the needle under ultrasound, it makes it much easier to see. It's not that the fellow was particularly nervous in this case. So we can, we can put a needle in and aspirate the lesion. And then once it's completely drained, then we inject the corticosteroid trying to leave the structure as small as possible. Here's an example of a patient who had a symptomatic popliteal cyst, it wasn't specifically a Baker cyst, but it shows the potential of this uh, technique. Sagittal T2 weighted MRI showing the lobulated lesion posteriorly. And on the axial image, you can see the lesion and you can see that it's actually compressing his popliteal artery and the, the tibial nerve is right in this neighborhood too. And that's also being pushed off to the side. Now, surgeon could go in and, and decompress this, but it's, a, it's an area of the body where surgeons are pretty reluctant to go in unless they really need to go in because of scarring and all these important structures back here. So we offered this patient drainage, and so here's the um, kind of sagittal ultrasound image, needle coming into the lesion here, and here's afterwards uh, decompressing the lesion, making it much smaller, and one of the points I'll make is that to drain these things, sometimes the fluid is very thick and you may need to use some thinner fluid like lidocaine or bupivacaine or even saline to kind of loosen up the thick fluid and, and eventually get it out. Um, in terms of needle size, usually we're successful with a needle that's fairly small, like a 21 gauge needle. Um, often we'll go to an 18 gauge needle if it's really thick fluid in a safe area. Um, Rarely, I've gone to a 16 or a 14 gauge needle, but that's getting to be a little bit, a um, little bit large, and makes me a little bit nervous. So here's this. This patient actually came back after about a year. So the initial MRI compressing the vessel and the nerve here, uh, the lesion was basically stayed gone, and his artery and the nerve were no longer um, compressed. His his issues were more patellofemoral at that time. So really a good success in this patient. The fluid can be fairly thick, and here's a different patient where you can see the lesion here, and we're injecting with the needle here, and as you inject thin fluid, often you can get a sense when that fluid goes in how thick the fluid is inside. It's kind of very viscous, and so when we put a needle in, we may hook up a, a tubing and kind of lavage in and out, kind of rinse in and out, and eventually uh, that, that process can, can thin up the fluid and allow you to drain it all the way out. And that helps to avoid having you go to a larger needle. There are a lot of bursae and cysts that occur about the knee. Um, the pes anserine tendons here anteromedially are a fairly common source of bursal inflammation, as in this patient. And here's an example. The patient was an obstetrician, actually, and she had this pain anteromedial knee with this pretty well-defined collection here and here on this axial MRI on ultrasound. Um, skin surface is here, the tibia is here, and here's the lesion. And one of the things I'm showing here is to use color flow to look for vessels. Uh, we'll hit on that again in a minute. But obviously, we want to try to avoid neighboring vessels and also make sure that this is a cystic lesion as opposed to a solid lesion. Um, paralabral cysts about the shoulder are common. And if you see one of these, it's almost certain that the patient has a torn labrum. It may not be showing that well in this patient, but this. This was a patient who had um, a chronic injury and was having increasing pain in the shoulder and had this multilobulated cystic lesion in the 
spinal glenoid notch region here. And on MRI, it's really easy to see. Right here, you can see his superior labrum with a little tear in there. We don't see the direct connection on this cut, but there's the lesion impressing on the supraspinatus. And an ultrasound is pretty easy to see. So the skin is up here, or here's supraspinatus, here's the cyst. Um, and these look sort of easy, but I'll tell you the shoulders can be difficult because it uh, can, can be a deep area to get into. Um, there's not a great acoustic window, really, if you think about the clavicle and the scapular spine and so on. So it can be a little bit challenging. That viscous fluid and so forth can be a challenge, but we've been pretty successful draining these over the years and probably have done on the order of 25 or 30 patients using um, ultrasound guidance. And it, it really can be very helpful because surgeons, again, are very reluctant to go digging around in this area because they don't wanna cause injury to the suprascapular nerve that's in that same location. So I have a number of patients that have benefited a lot from this and this was the only therapy they needed. Now, having said that, it's often the case that you wanna think through the situation like, well, this is a secondary effect of the fact that the patient's got a labral tear, so maybe they need the primary issue uh, addressed as well, and that's certainly true, but that may be the timing isn't quite right for that at the time we drain the cyst, or we may actually drain the cyst right around the same time they get the surgery, but we've basically dealt with the cyst separately. And I've even gone up to the operating room to drain cysts when they're scoping the patient because they don't want to go um, exploring in the area of the nerve. There are some situations that may be not uh, beneficial to do drainage. Um, there's relatively few things that are going to be outright dangerous to drain, but here's an example of a tarsal tunnel cystic lesion here. You see the multilobular structures here. And these are the nerves. This is the medial ankle, like posterior tibial nerve, terminal, terminal branches here. And you can see it's right superficial to this cyst. So the questions that would come up are, could you damage a nerve by going through it? You, you potentially could, so you can usually see those with ultrasound. The other, the bigger question is really, if we drain this, will it be successful? And if it's a multilocular structure, it may not be as easy to drain, or you may not completely drain it. You'd rather not do multiple skin punctures if you can avoid it. Um, so generally speaking, I will be happy to try to drain these types of things um, to see if it does help the patient, but you have to be careful. And there may be situations where it's like, boy, I really don't know if I can help this patient significantly, so we'd rather um, not do the case. Here's an example that came in a number of years ago, and it was some outside film, so I couldn't window level them, but it shows a lesion adjacent to the distal femur that's quite hypo-intense on T1-weighted MRI here and here, and the T2-weighted scan is here, and it's pretty similar in intensity to this uh, joint recess. Um, but it's an unusual location for a cystic lesion. So the surgeon had actually said, he said, yeah, I, I tried to drain it in the office and I got some fluid out, but I couldn't really get it completely, so he sent it in to us. And so the first part of the process is to put the ultrasound probe on the lesion and assess it. And so here, the femur would be down here, and you can see it's pretty clear with color Doppler that this has got internal vascularity to it. It's a solid lesion, has arterial flow and venous flow, and this is a lesion that we sort of back up and say, well, we, we can't drain this. It's not a cyst, and it needs to be seen by orthopedic oncology. Um, this particular case, I, I actually went ahead and did a biopsy in, in um, collaboration with the orthopedic, orthopedic oncologist, and it turned out that this was a myxoid liposarcoma. So one point about this case, too, just going back, is just remember that in MSK, that lesions that are well-defined lesions that may in fact look somewhat cystic to us um, can in fact be malignant. So we can't really tell with soft tissue lesions their benign or malignant status. So the take-home points about the draining cysts and bursa is that we should address the internal derangement first. So cases of Baker cysts, usually the patients had uh, the lesion or had the knee scoped and looked at meniscal tears or cartilage issues, but the patient has a persistent Baker cyst uh, after surgery. They may have mechanical symptoms, can't fully flex all the way, or they may have local pain. Again, if somebody has a cystic lesion back there, but it's not symptomatic, it's probably not worth uh, intervening on it. Use color Doppler to check that it is in fact cystic. Use color flow to avoid the vessels. Uh, one of the things we learn with these cases is to know where all the little nerves run and to try to identify them and avoid them. That idea about using thin fluid to loosen up thick fluid 
Um, and if you're getting started with this, Baker cysts are a good way to start and uh, sort of stay out of trouble. The next um, section is on peritendinous and inflammation and tenosynovitis. And so this is inflammatory disorders around tendons. And so peritendinitis is where the tendon doesn't really have a sheath, but it has inflammatory change around it. So here's a axial T2-weighted image of the right hip, femoral head, acetabulum. And this is the iliopsoas tendon going right in front of the hip. And you can see here and on the sagittal image that there's some edema right adjacent to the tendon here. So that's, that's peritendinous inflammatory change. It's possible that could be a strain injury as well, but in the right setting, it's more of a chronic situation or subacute, so it goes along with inflammatory change. And you can imagine this is a, a pretty, uh, it's a fairly common disorder and it really mimics internal derangement of the hip, but it's not a hip joint problem, it's really a tendon problem. So we've done a number of these procedures over the years and this illustrates the, the procedure. So patients lying supine, transducers up here, patient's head would be here and feet down here. So here's the femoral head, acetabulum, and here's the iliopsoas tendon coursing right in front of the hip here. This shows a uh, needle coming in through the iliopsoas and coming up to abut the tendon here and then injecting fluid right along the course of the tendon. So something like this, we would take around five cc's of bupivacaine, mix in some corticosteroid and get that fluid to track up and down the tendon where we know the inflammation is located. So here's a little cine clip and showing needle going into a butt the tendon and fluid tracking up and down along the tendon like this. So we do this in athletes. We also do it in patients that have had hip replacements and have iliopsoas problems after the hip arthroplasty. Another peritendinous inflammatory process that we see commonly in, in runners especially is hamstring. And so here's the left hip femur, ischial tuberosity, and the proximal hamstring tendons. And on the T2-weighted scan, you can see just a little bit of edema around these hamstrings here. And that's peritendinous inflammation. It's fairly mild, as I said, in this case. It can, it can definitely get much more severe. The key thing to know in this area is that this end structure, that's the sciatic nerve. So that's obviously something we want to avoid if we're going to be doing an injection. And it turns out we can actually see that pretty well with ultrasound. So here's a cine clip of that. And so the patient would be prone, ischial tuberosity here, proximal hamstring tendons is this structure here, and needle coming in kind of through the glutes, coming up to abut the hamstring tendon, and then getting it to track up and down along the tendon there. It's kind of variable how well we see the fluid tracking up and down, but this has been quite effective. And um, Maurice Zissen helped write this up a few years ago. And, we're trying to get good information about whether these things really help or not in a, in a sort of evidence-based medicine way. And in our hamstring series of about, we're about 70 patients starting out and um, more than half the patients got some benefit for a short period of time, like a few weeks and about um, uh, less than half got long-term relief, but, but it was still significantly beneficial in the majority of patients. And there's, there's not a lot of other good options for these folks. So, one concept here is that once we do one of these procedures, it's important for the patient to try to address whatever mechanical issues they may have that, that may be inciting the problem, whether that's overuse or some leg length discrepancy or um, other factors that may be promoting the injury. Now, when you come to the bone service, you may see us do tenograms. And so this is another concept about treating tendon, peritendinous inflammation, but this is, this is really for tenosynovitis. And so Here's a former fellow who volunteered to have me draw on her skin in a pretty crummy sort of artistic way, but showing the, the lateral ankle where the fibula is here and the, the perineal tendons as they course down laterally along the ankle and foot. So what we do is we, we use fluoroscopy and identify the bone, put a small needle right between the tendon and the bone, and then inject radiographic contrast mixed with uh, anesthetic to fill up the tendon sheath. And basically, imaging-wise, what we're looking for is how smooth or irregular the tendon sheath looks. And so the perineal tendons, you can actually see two filling defects in here, the dark gray uh, structures that are the, each of the longest and the brevis tendons. Um, there's a little outpouching here that's a normal structure between the retinaculae, so there's certain normal things that we see. This is a pretty normal-looking um, tenogram in this case. But once we um, 
what, once we access the, uh, the sheath, then, then we put in some short-acting corticosteroid to treat the inflammatory change. So another benefit of tenography using fluoroscopy is we can also distend the tendon sheath and kind of stretch out to help treat uh, adhesions, uh, inflammation that may be causing relative stenoses. Sometimes we do these under ultrasound, and um, one of the main reasons we continue to use fluoroscopy is because the podiatrists that refer the patients in, they really like that tenographic image that we get with, with fluoro and x-ray. Um, this was a Stanford soccer player a couple of years ago who has had um, some tendinopathy, some internal signal within the perineus longus tendon here, had some tenosynovitis, but was in season, very competitive player, and wanted to be treated uh, so he could get through the season. Ultimately, he did go to get this uh, surgically debrided. But in his case, we used ultrasound to guide the injection, and it's fairly simple to do that. Here's the pre-injection images. This would be the calcaneus here, one of the tendons here, and one here with a little bit of fluid around them. Then just use the ultrasound to guide a small needle into the sheath. So here's tendon, tendon surrounded by fluid. Here's a nice longitudinal image. So here's one tendon, the other tendon filled up with bupivacaine and some short-acting corticosteroid to treat the inflammation. So for peritendinous injections, we really try to avoid injecting corticosteroid if there's any signs of a tear. Um, if there's minor degrees of tearing, no options for the patient, we may inject small amounts of water-soluble steroid like dexamethasone, but we really don't want to inject any longer-acting steroid with uh, the concern that perhaps that could weaken the tendon. Um, having said that, I know I've done over a thousand of those tenogram injections in my time here, and we've never, as far as I know, had a complication in terms of a, a tendinous rupture. Ultrasound guidance helps us avoid intratendinous injection. That's fairly obvious. And as I mentioned, it's important to then address what are the primary sources of uh, the, the patient's problem. So the last part's on muscle contusion and strain, and this is fairly big business, especially in football season. Um, patients will get all kinds of bumps and bruises and um, muscle contusions, strains, hematomas, tears, all this stuff that goes along with um, sporting activity. More of the contact sports, obviously, than the, than the uh, distance type sports like running, hopefully. Um, here's a patient who was a professional football player and this is a scan of the femur. It may be hard to tell, it's, it's the thigh. So you can see on this image, here's a sagittal. This is part of the femur, and this is anteriorly. All this muscle edema and this ovoid heterogeneous structure here. So one of the things to try to figure out is, well, is that really a drainable collection or not? And I can tell you looking at this that it's pretty heterogeneous. So that's a hematoma, but it's not clearly like simple fluid at this point. But I would say you really don't know for sure if it's going to be drainable until you ultrasound it or you try. So often we'll try, um, and it depends on the, the certain athlete as well. So in professional sports, the patients are much more aggressive about wanting to get something done. So here was the ultrasound on that patient. Here's the, the skin, quadriceps muscle, femur would be down in here. Pretty heterogeneous collection. I think you could probably predict from your ultrasound experience, this is probably not going to be drainable. Um, Indeed, we, you know, he said, do whatever you want to do, doc. And so I put a needle in there. Here's the tip of the needle. Tried to inject some lidocaine to see if it would loosen up. Um, no fluid was obtained from that, so it really wasn't a successful procedure. Um, as a quick aside, people have said, well, why don't you just inject some TPA into these things and try to drain it out that way? And um, one, I'm not sure that would be that effective um, in this situation, and two, I'm um, certainly very worried about the idea of TPA or something causing more hemorrhage, especially in a, in a professional athlete. So I have not um, gone down that road. Here's an example that was successful, though. This was a Sanford football player and had a, taken a blow to the, to the uh, quadriceps region, T1 weighted MRI, T2. You see all this fluid in between, like the rectus here and the vastus musculature ultrasound here with without and with color flow showing that there's some regional vessels but no internal flow and one of the tricks we can use for this is uh, is it drainable or not and you just take the probe and the skin and you mash on it and if it collapses like this it's clearly like a pocket of fluid that's likely to be drainable so that's a simple thing to do 
And uh, so something like this, we can pretty easily then put a needle in, drain the majority of that collection out of there, and uh, really reduce the pressure from these collections. Other patients get high-grade muscle injuries or tendon tears. This was a, a 49er who had basically torn the rectus femoris off the anterior inferior iliac spine here that should have been up here, and the tendon is now here retracted down. There's a hematoma here. And you know, you might think, well, that's a surgical lesion. And in some situations, that could be a surgical lesion. But surprisingly, a lot of these muscle and tendon tears will heal up pretty well without surgery. So depending on the situation, um, surgery may not be indicated or may not be desired at the time. So they'll, they'll treat it conservatively. But what do you do to get this guy back onto the playing field? Um, well, we can use ultrasound to guide a, a, a drainage of that. So here's, here's a, a bit of the femoral head here, proximals here. So here's this collection here proximally, and here's the stump of the iliopsoas, I'm uh, sorry, the rectus as it's retracted down. The needle's coming in here, and I don't show the cine clip, but this is the after, where you can see proximal and distal. Hematoma's all drained, and you can see that the, uh, the distal part of the tendon here has been more closely opposed to the more proximal part, so we think that's a good thing, right? Getting the tendon ends closer together may promote healing. This was a fun case that um, I think maybe my training in uh, abdominal imaging also helped me to be more comfortable doing this, this case. But um, the athlete was a, a pro football player, and on a kickoff, he, he was running down the field at high speed, and one of the players from the opposing team basically kicked him in the uh, lower right lower quadrant here. And um, pretty high energy uh, impact. It basically had to remove the player's shoe from this poor guy's abdomen. Um, but you can see what happened to him. He basically, you know, tore his internal oblique muscle here and had a hematoma or some external, but pretty deep hematoma there right at the uh, iliac crest. And needless to say, you need to be careful about going in on something like this, that you don't hit something like the colon, for example. Um, but having good guidance, you can be careful and systematic about it. So here's the images on him where skin surface, external oblique. Here's the internal oblique. The iliac crest would be here. And here's that hematoma in the internal oblique region. Check for blood flow, right? Looking for vessels in the neighborhood to try to avoid hitting those. Actually was able to drain the hematoma completely. 20 cc's came out of that. And you might think that's a pretty severe injury. It's almost like he had an appendectomy or something. but he was able to play actually the um, the subsequent Sunday. So it happened on a Sunday game. We drained it on a Tuesday. He played the following Sunday without much sequelae. So some of these guys are pretty tough, I must say, but um, potentially that helped him get back on the field sooner. When you get hit in the thigh, it's a common situation that the the bone is sort of the backstop and you get these deep quadriceps collections from, from injuries to the thigh, like this big, deep collection right abutting the femur here. So here's the axial image. Here's the sagittal image with the femurs here, and this big, ugly collection here with kind of a thick rim to it. Now, we may be successful getting some fluid out of this component here, maybe that there, but it's pretty heterogeneous. Um, one of the things we think may be helpful about this is that in these types of in, in, um, injuries, patients tend to form bone in there. And so we think that draining these may help decrease the extent of myositis ossificans that can occur. Now this, this would be, usually patients are treated with indomethacin to try to prevent that from occurring. They may get myositis. This is actually from a different patient. But if that's sitting there and is asymptomatic, it's really not too much of a long-term problem. So we don't have systematic results on that, but I will say that we're more aggressive about draining these lesions than we used to be in the, in the past. Since it's baseball season, I wanted to show an example of an oblique strain because you hear about these injuries. And essentially what happens is the, the, the throwing athletes, um, they tend to get these oblique strains on the opposite side of their dominant arm. So this, this pitcher was a left-handed pitcher so going through the acceleration and release phase of the pitch, they really forcibly contract the contralateral side of the abdominal wall to get the velocity up. And that can lead to tension and strain injuries on the opposite side of the um, oblique. So here's a different patient 
where you see the ribs here on a sagittal MRI in this area here where there's a little bit of edema within the muscles where there's the obliques are partly torn off the ribs. And um, Kate Stevens and I wrote this up a few years ago because we did about four um, professional pitchers over the course of a couple of years. And basically there's not much to drain there, but you can inject a little bit of corticosteroid to try to reduce inflammation. And more recently, more interest is in injecting platelet-rich plasma to try to promote a healing response. But if you look at MLB.com and look up oblique injuries, these are really common injuries in pitchers, and they can take them out for, for weeks and uh, sometimes months at a time. Other examples of hematoma strain or just strain injury, this was a, a Stanford basketball player, and she had, um, she had strained her semitendinosus muscle. So here's femur, here's hamstrings, you see this feathery edema in the muscle tendon junction here and tendon here. It wasn't completely disrupted, but there was some increased signal within the tendon itself here. So this is like semimembranosis, semitendinosis here with surrounding edema. And what I've seen and other people have seen over the years is that, you know, you can get by without this tendon. It's in fact a tendon that people will harvest to do an ACL reconstruction. Um, so it's not a critical structural tendon. But patients that get strain injuries and infl inflammation around there, it turns out they end up getting a lot of scar tissue that forms at this interface between the membranosis and the tendinosis. So the, the technique with her was to make sure that we got the fluid and injected some anti-inflammatory right between the membranosis and the tendinosis, and they get her into therapy, physical therapy, to get whatever scar tissue she forms stretched out and so on. Um, and this was really quite effective. She she was out for a week or so when this injury occurred. Then we did the injection. She was out for another about a week, but then she was able to go and play through the rest of the season um, and really never had any further sequelae from this. So a little bit unusual, but, but just an example of the concepts. Platelet-rich plasma, you may hear about this in the news, and it's kind of uh, popular now, maybe becoming less popular. By the way, it's not necessarily um, a banned substance if you're following, you know, sports uh, reporting, um, because it's basically a material that's derived from one's own blood. And what, what one does is you take about 50 cc's of blood, put it in a centrifuge and spin it down to get the platelets and all the, the syrup that surrounds the platelets. And the thinking is that that concentrated platelet plasma, it has all kinds of good stuff in it, like platelet derived growth factor, vascular endothelial growth, all these different growth factors that in a concentrated fashion, they may help stimulate a healing response. It's that plus sometimes needling a tendon or causing some kind of little bit of injury that then with our needle that then this goes and starts to stimulate a healing response uh, may be beneficial. The jury's still out on it. There's a fair amount of work on it. And there's a, there's a nice review article in AJR about the imaging and the concepts in 2011. It's not really covered by insurance. A lot of people are offering this as a cash only um, type of a proce uh, procedure. Um, we're able to do it here. We try to get some insurance to reimburse it. Um, it's a billing quagmire, so I won't get into that. But it's, um, it's, it's intriguing because it's kind of getting towards like biological therapy and may make more sense than um, corticosteroids. Some of the thinking is that that P, uh, PRP, as it's called, has anti-inflammatory properties. Um, it also seems to be a really potent analgesic. It doesn't like anesthetize like, like an anesthetic does, but it may help reduce the pain response that people have in these areas. So here's an example where we use PRP in a, a professional football player, and he had a biceps muscle strain, and so it's a partial tear of uh, biceps femoris here. Here's the longitudinal image. It's a deep structure here. Here's his marker capsule. And so it's way down deep where myotendin disjunction. Here's the sciatic nerve as it's heading down the thigh to avoid that. So with this, we can go down and identify that area on ultrasound. This is actually after the injection. Find that tendinous component and inject the PRP right along that myotendinous strain injury there. And again, we don't have great systematic follow-up on these, but but um, Patients have not had complications. They've returned to play um, with a reasonable time frame, given what you might expect for them if they had not had the procedure. Um, and hopefully over time, we'll get some more systematic knowledge to know whether this is really doing anything.
other areas that we're using PRP, medial collateral ligament sprain. So here's a MCL that's markedly thickened and heterogeneous, a partial tear. A lot of these players can go back and play if this heals up, it may take a few weeks, but we're using PRP to inject intraligamentous here to try to stimulate faster healing in these situations. Another common thing that we're doing is more chronic, which is patellar tendinopathy, partial tearing. You see a little bit of bone edema and this focus of increased signal in the patellar tendon. We go in, the ultrasound, we, we needle up that area and try to kind of break up the tendinopathy. Um, we try to abrade the bone a little bit, uh, which may re help release some growth factors and kind of stimulate the bone tendon interface. Um, and then we're following these patients to see how they do as far as pain goes. It's a little bit hard to interpret this image, but this is the inferior pole of the patella. Here's the patellar tendon coming up, and you can, there's a needle coming in here. You can't quite see it, but it's pretty simple. It's pretty superficial. There's not much to get in trouble with. I will say that this is really painful for the patients, so um, we need to put a little bit of local in there to start out. So as far as the take-home points on the hematoma and strain, you may not know whether something is going to be liquefied, um, so it's worth doing ultrasound to check. Often hematomas are liquid acutely, and then they go through this clot and lysis phase, so maybe later on they're more amenable to drainage. Draining the collections help reduce the pain, it kind of reduces the pressure, may get the muscle and tendon ends closer together. And like I said, we don't really know what the role is going to be of PRP or other growth factors, but it's intriguing as far as what we're going to be doing in the future. So in conclusion, that's some of the background and a few examples of interventional sports medicine. And it's clear that we have a really increasingly sophisticated imaging diagnosis um, around Stanford. We're lucky to have a lot of athletes and uh, professional and recreational and collegiate that we have a lot of injuries generated from. So we have the case material. Good guidance methods, and we can really combine our diagnostic skills with our procedural skills to do these things. And it really can have a big impact on symptoms and help people return to competition sooner, I think, without necessarily increasing their risk. And the final point is that what's clearly happening is that clinical colleagues are buying ultrasound machines um, and using this technology, which is re very reasonable, right, because it's a good thing to do. We don't know how well trained they are or how good they are at it, but I think we want to keep it in radiology as much as possible and be able to offer not only the diagnostic skills, uh, and imaging, but the therapeutic skills as well. So we're really working hard to try to figure out how we can stay in the game here and not have this uh, be sort of taken away from us. So at that point, I want to thank you for your attention, um, and I'll be happy to take any questions offline here.